Is your dog ready to go to work with you or even leave the house? Well, we have AKC's Animal Behaviorist on set to answer your questions about what makes your canine do the things he does. Plus, who is top dog? That's all coming up now on AKC Live. Welcome back to AKC Live, bringing you the latest dog news and entertainment from the American Kennel Club. I'm Sam Ryan, and we are coming to you, it looks a little different this week, from our new unfinished super cool studio in Brooklyn. So happy to be here, and you'll see us here in future weeks. In AKC Sports News, let's get to that. We are bringing you the top 10 confirmation dog rankings this month. So we're going to begin with number 10, and that goes to Ty, the giant schnauzer from Exeter, Rhode Island. Number nine from Westfield, Massachusetts, an American Staffordshire Terrier named Louie. Number eight from Flower Mound, Texas, a boxer named Wilma. Number seven from Rayleigh, California, a wire fox terrier known as King. To number six from East Berlin, Pennsylvania, a Pekingese named Bernie. Number five is a pug called Biggie from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. To number four from Gilroy, California, an Akita who goes by the name of Nick. Well, the number three dog in the country is Grant. Grant is a black Cocker Spaniel from Knoxville, Tennessee. Number two we're down to from Santa Barbara, California, the French Bulldog named Princeton. And the number one dog this month, congratulations to the old English Sheepdog from Colorado Springs, Colorado, named Elsa. And congratulations to all of them. Well, what does it take to be the top dog? AKC top dog rankings are calculated every month. At the end of the year, the race for the number one dog is determined. And you can find out more where you can go to AKC.TV and search for Road to the Best in Show. And mark this on your calendar. This Friday is National Take Your Dog to Work Day. A Central Michigan University study recently found that having a dog in a group office setting encourages employees to be more cooperative and friendly and engage in conversation. You see that when you're walking your dog on the street. Well, in the office it works as well. More and more companies are allowing dogs into the office. So if you're lucky enough to work at one of these companies, we've got some tips for you. Before bringing your canine friend to the office, make sure he is vaccinated and that all of his shots are up to date. Once you get the okay from your boss in your HR department, it's vital to make sure that your office area is dog proofed. Make sure exposed wires near your desk are taped down to avoid electrocution. If there are kitchen cabinets and trash cans that may contain food or cleaning products, make sure to use child safety latches to secure them. Even the most socialized dog will need to feel at home in this new environment. Make sure to pack a bag with everything you'll need for the day, including a water and food bowl, a familiar better blanket to help him feel secure, some toys and treats, a leash for walks, and cleanup bags to pick up waste. Keep in mind, no one likes a stinky pooch, so make sure to give your dog a bath and have him properly groomed before bringing him to meet your colleagues. It's also helpful to have a work buddy who agrees to watch your dog if you go to a meeting or a call the way from your desk. So some of the benefits of bringing your pet to work are stress relief, work-life balance, collaboration, and employee wellness and retention and recruiting. But it's important that your dog is well behaved. So with that being said, we've asked Dr. Mary Birch to join us today to answer your questions about keeping your canine well kept. We have guests here. We're also going to take some of your Facebook questions as well. But Dr. Birch, first of all, you're a board certified behavior analyst. What does that mean? Um, that is actually the human end of the leash. And so I'm also a certified applied animal behaviorist through the Animal Behavior Society and a certified dog behavior consultant through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. Well, thank you for joining us today. Like I said, we're going to go to some of the Facebook questions and we have one right now. And Stephen writes in and wants to know, um, need help with my dog and his severe separation anxiety. So what would you do, what kind of advice would you give to someone whose dog, you know, we see this at times with separation anxiety from their owner. Separation anxiety is a, can, can be a common problem. We usually make a distinction between anxiety and a separation issue. Anxiety is a physiological state. The dog is panting and pacing and drooling, things like that. 
um, separation issues are the dog turns into Tom Cruise, slides across the floor when you leave in his <laughs> socks and underwear, gets the broom, plays it like a guitar, and in the background you hear old time rock and roll playing. So that dog's just having a good time. Now the dog having a good time might need something appropriate to do, some interactive games and toys. The dog with separation anxiety needs a training program. And that involves you leave for a very short period of time, go outside, close the door, come back in. Leave the dog with some words like, watch the house, I'll be back. Say the same thing every time. You do it on a weekend when you have some time. Go out one or two seconds, come back in. Go out three seconds, come back in. It takes a while. Build up to five minutes, ten minutes, and so on. And that's kind of how that treatment program goes. Is that establishing a trust? Is that what that is? I think so. And it's just sort of um, conditioning the dog to know that you leave, you always come back. And I'm not sure how well they mark time, but by repeated exposure to that kind of a procedure, they learn that they're going to be okay. And if you have trouble implementing it, that may be a time to contact an animal behaviorist who can help you. I have a question for you. Um, I have an eight-year-old Sheltie, a Shetland Sheepdog, and we like to bring her on daily walks. She does, you know, prefer walking. Last summer, she, um, a dog got loose, a dog, while we were walking her, and the dog went after her, and this was a, an aggressive a behavior dog. Um, she's okay. My, my Shetland Sheepdog is okay. She was able to, to make it home off the leash, and she ran home. But now she's timid. She, as we take her on walks, if she hears a dog bark from behind a fence, she wants to run home. What do I need to do? What do we as the owners need to do to make her feel more comfortable? Well, I'm sorry that happened. And Shelties can be just, they're wonderful, sensitive dogs. So I would say you want to make the walk fun for her. You don't want to avoid taking her where the incident happened, but take her some places um, that are new places to her where maybe she would have a good time and then start that walk that's a problem, go a very short distance, watch me, sit, give her a treat, turn around and go home. You don't have to do the whole walk and then gradually extend the time. It's called counter conditioning where you're countering the bad experience that she had. Is it wrong for me when I see another dog coming towards us regardless of the size of the dog, it could be a dachshund, I pull her and we, we turn around and I try to avoid the, uh, inter any type of interaction, is that wrong? Am I doing something wrong there? Well, I probably wouldn't avoid other dogs. I would say um, teach her some other skills, mm -hmm. some very basic obedience. I would have, do a sit and watch procedure. Sit, watch, watch me, good girl, here's a treat. And then gradually you can get closer to the other dogs. Okay, that's awesome advice, thank you. We're going back to our Facebook questions and Lori writes in, my dog has become overprotective and does not like to let other people in the house. Why would this behavior start? Well, without seeing the dog, I really couldn't say why the behavior started. If you did a workup on that dog, you might ask a lot of questions, Lori. You might say, did it start when the dog became sexually mature? Did you have a friend over who had somebody with a loud voice that scared the dog? Yeah. Something like that. So, overprotective is it sounds like your dog loves you, you love the dog, maybe you've got a good bond going on, and the dog is protecting you. Um, dogs sometimes do something called resource guarding, where they protect their food or their toys, and you might be just another one of their resources. So your job here, and unfortunately, I hate to say this about women, but sometimes women will think it's kind of cool, my dog's really protecting me. And you know, you, you have to put, have a firm hand in this and take control, not be punishing, not be aversive, but teach the dog some skills and then not let that happen. I would say um, if there's some specific people that come over, you can maybe meet them in the yard, put the dog on a leash, and then um, bring them in the house with the dog. That's awesome. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Birch. When we come back, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to hear from our guests who are here with their dogs. So we're going to uh, open up the questions to them to figure out what they want to ask you. So more with Dr. Birch when we come back here on AKC Live. We're coming right back. This is the face of unconditional love. At the AKC Canine Health Foundation, we want what every dog owner wants, for the pets who love us to live longer, healthier lives. To make this happen, we fund scientific research to help prevent, treat, and cure canine disease. We fund education, including canine health conferences and veterinary fellowships. We fund what we believe will have the best chance of improving the lives of dogs. We can't do it without you. Go to akcchf.org and donate today. And we are back here on AKC Live. As promised, Dr. Birch back with us. And we're here with Ellen and Jillian. And we have uh, some guests with us as well. Who do we have with us? Winston and Ruby. And Ruby is um, 
taking, uh, she's comfortable. Taking a little nap. <laughs> <laughs> As is Ernie down there. Hi, got Ernie, hello. So you guys have some questions for Dr. Birch as well. Yes, uh, so my first question is regarding digging. So Winston likes to dig. Is there something that I can do or you think it's something that he will grow out of? You know, I like that question because it points out that there isn't one answer for a problem like digging. So I could say to you, here's an idea. Yeah. In your backyard of your lovely new home, put a digging pit in and uh, teach the dog that this is where you can dig as opposed to over here in this flower bed. That's one answer. Another one is an animal behaviorist would look at the dog and say, why is it digging? I was once getting my hair cut by somebody who said, um, I have this dog, she's digging in my flower beds. Uh, it's just frustrating. She just determined to do that. Well, then you hear the story. It's 95 degrees. It's the summertime. It's a black dog. It's outside all day. It's digging to get cool. So I was actually brave and had a lot of courage. With a person with scissors in my hair, I said, the problem isn't the dog, it's you. What are we going to do about getting this dog some air conditioning or a fan? So the dog moved into the kitchen, and that seemed to be the treatment for that. Sometimes um, digging can be breed specific. So you might have a dog like a dachshund, which is a hound that uh, goes looking for vermin, uh, part of its roots and its genealogy and its heritage. And when dogs do that, a good idea is to come to AKC and find some good exercises and activities that have to do with digging like barn hunt or earth dog. Thank you. Jillian and Ernie, yeah. any questions? I don't think Ernie's going to ask. I, know. <laughs> I don't think these dogs have any behavior problems. <laughs> they look pretty good. But Ernie is a chewer, so I wanted to know how I can help prevent him from chewing things that he shouldn't. Things that he shouldn't chew. So you got to take those red bottom high heels and lock <laughs> them up every day and make sure that your house is pretty much dog proof. Okay. And then find some things that he likes to chew. So sometimes people will say, they'll say the brand name, I bought a product, it's a hard plastic, it looks like a bone, I give it to him, he just doesn't seem to chew that. The, the deal is if he's not chewing it when you're home, he's probably not gonna chew it on the weekend when you're gone. So you might wanna do some reinforcer sampling with that, get a variety of things, a bully stick, some kind of those interactive toys that you can stuff with a treat and see if he'll chew those. And always check with your vet and make sure that the veterinarian's okay with that particular product. Let's head back to your questions via Facebook. And Bree writes, and my older dog is sitting on me. He growls at my younger dog when he comes near me. Why does he do this? Well, that sounds like you need to do some training with both dogs together. Um, again, it sounds like it might be like what we talked about before, protection and um, resource guarding. And you happen to be the resource. So I would start teaching those dogs some functional skills. Sit down, stay side by side, giving them treats. When you work together nicely, good things are going to come to you. And we see Winston and Ruby working together nicely. <laughs> Ellen, yeah. do you have another question? I do. Um, so Ruby is a little bit skittish um, around loud noises. Is there something that I can do to make her feel more comfortable? So when you go on walks, something yeah. like that? Well, the treatment of choice for loud noises and um, noise sensitivity and noise phobia is desensitization. And the way you would do that would be you'd start with quieter noises, gradually make them louder and louder. Now here's the deal. You can't call the truck driver that goes on 47th Street at 5.30 afternoon and unload his truck and say, I'm coming by on Tuesday, could you do it quietly? But the great <laughs> news is this is a common problem and they have a lot of CDs that you can order specifically with sounds, uh, including fireworks and city noises. You start with those at a quiet noise and then gradually make it louder. That usually takes about five days to fix that. Oh, wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned loud noises because I'm actually, July 4th is coming and I'm having a barbecue. So I'm worried that he's going to be scared of the fireworks. So what can I do to make sure he's okay? Okay, well, you guys are obviously responsible. But for other people, one thing you definitely don't want to do is take the dog to the fireworks. Their hearing is much more sensitive than ours. They don't care about it. They don't know about 1776 and the Treaty of Paris. Fourth of July really isn't for them. You don't want to ever put dogs in the backyard. They can jump fences or go under fences. And animal control agencies all across the country kind of panic at the Fourth of July. So in your case, you're going to be home. You might give them a quiet place like a crate with maybe a towel over it or something like that. You might turn on the TV with some of the Fourth of July celebrations to kind of mask the sound. You can also try something that um, people recommend. I haven't had personally, I haven't had luck with it. Um, there are a variety of vests, shirts, jackets that you can buy. They're supposed to calm dogs with noises and that kind of thing. You could try that. There are also some homeopathic remedies. 
Thank you. Great advice. Robbie writes in via Facebook. Um, I have a three year old dachshund. He has four other siblings. I have taken him out to socialize many times from the time he was a puppy. He to this day cannot handle being around other people besides myself and my husband. And he does not like other dogs except his siblings. How do I get him to calm down and accept other dogs and people? I would probably say put him in a class where you have a good instructor, some other dogs, and they can slowly start exposing him to other dogs and activities in a training class. And you're doing it in the presence of someone who knows what they're looking at. He might start at a distance from those dogs and then move them closer, be moved closer. It doesn't matter what age they are to start a class, a behavior class. Never too late. Never you can teach an old dog new tricks. See, you can. That's awesome. <laughs> we are coming right back here with more questions from Dr. Bert Birch here and more answers from Dr. Birch here when we come back here on AKC Live. My favorite part about being a breeder is putting that puppy into a person's hands. The relationship between the owner and breeder is really important. It's something that's ongoing for the life of the dog. Some of them live in my home. Some of them I don't ever want to let go. Running around and playing with dogs all week long, it's nothing better. The most important thing that you're going to want is a healthy dog. When we sell a puppy to a new family, they become part of our family. We're there to help them for the life of the dog. Back here on AKC Live as we continue the questions with Dr. Birch here and uh, Ellen and Jillian. We're going to continue as, oh, well, look at Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Ernie is has a little separation issues. Mm -hmm. So I've tried everything to even create training. I was just wondering what I could do to make him not so scared. For separation anxiety, the treatment is um, what I described before. So you would basically go out a short period of time, come back in. You can also try some interactive toys and games to give him something to do. But that's pretty much what that is. Great. So when you train your dog and you have a dog that, that's not uh, treat motivated? Are there other positive reinforcement techniques that I can use that might work better? There are. Um, I would say that if you're training for sports, food is kind of an easy um, positive reinforcer to give. And so make sure you've done a reinforcer sampling assessment. You've tried some of the commercial treats. You've tried little bits of steak. You've tried some dried liver. You've tried some other things. I had a dog that would take food and it would be fine. We went to agility. One night I didn't have anything. I got some ham out of the refrigerator. I never knew the dog was really motivated. He started to work and he was acting like, watch how slow I can go. It's not what you want in agility. I pulled out the ham and it was like he had a rocket in his pants. And that turned out to be the food that I hadn't discovered for him. But you can use toys and balls. Um, you'll see working police canine handlers using a tug game at the end. They'll tie a towel and a knot and the dog loves that. We're going to go back to Facebook and Michelle writes and just adopted a Newfoundland. We can't leave the house without him running to every window and to try to get out and destroys a few things on the counter. Any ideas? Um, that's the separation anxiety question that keeps coming up, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So that would be um, what about interactive games and toys? What about if he's not staying, staying safe, you may need to use a crate. What about um, have you done a lot of exercise in the morning and played with him so he's tired? They say a tired dog is a happy dog. He'll lay down and take a nap. Another thing you might consider, if the dog really had severe separation anxiety, you probably need to be with a veterinarian. It doesn't sound like the Newfoundland is, but they can prescribe some medication. And then also, um, you might want to consider a dog walker to come in and take him for a walk or dog daycare. Okay. You know, a question from me. Uh, occasion, it's a, an occasional occurrence, like I said, my Sheltie is eight years old, so she obviously is trained, she knows uh, where she needs to go, but every once in a while, maybe once, twice a year, she'll leave a present for us on the carpet, and you know, we don't know why this is happening when she's so good at telling us when she needs to go out. So I would say, um, are you sure that you know, she's been given enough time in the morning before you leave or whenever she does this to make sure that her bladder and her bowels are empty? And then if a dog has a periodic problem, you may want to just go back and do kind of a repeat as though they were a puppy of house training. Sort of start over with it. Short periods of time, reinforce her for going outside and see if that works. Another one I want to ask you, and we see Winston and Ruby together and so well behaved, and Ruby obviously the senior of the two. Um, we have an eight-year-old. What age do you feel is the best age to introduce a puppy, a second dog, to the family mix if you have an older dog? 
Well, if you have fallen in love with a puppy and you're determined to start with a new puppy, you're going to do that when you do it. So you want to make sure that the older dog maybe doesn't have any behavior problems and then introduce them on neutral ground, then maybe move them into the yard and then finally bring them into the house. And in the beginning, you would keep them crated or separated when you were gone to make sure that everybody stays safe. We're heading to uh, Facebook now and Zach writes, how, how to train your dog to walk by your side without having to be in a leash. And I see this occasionally too. You do see people walking side by side with the dog. Mm -hmm. And that's awfully shielding. And I would say I'd recommend an AKC class like Begin with Canine Good Citizen that is all done on leash and then progress to AKC obedience where that's actually one of the exercises. So you, the idea is you get the dog under really good control on leash, then the leash is faded to a very light line and then that's eventually taken off. And then you can use a food reward, hold the food at your waist and have the dog watch the food and use it as a lure and then a reinforcer. And I know every dog and every owner is different, but how long could that take? I'd say depending on the dog, maybe six months or a year. Before, if it's reliable and you practice regularly. It's really neat when you do see it too, and I do see walking in the neighborhood, and the dogs are just so well behaved too, walking side by side yeah. with their owners. Um, Ellen, Jillian, do you guys have any additional questions for Dr. Birch? Don't think, think so. Off the top of my head. Aww. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Ellen Winston and Ruby, and Ruby fell asleep <laughs> on us. They are well behaved. And, oh my gosh. Uh, and Jillian and Ernie sleeping as well. So thank you for joining us. And Dr. Mary Birch, thank you so much for answering thank you. the questions thank and spending you. time with us thank here you. in AKC. Thanks for Live. having me. Well, uh, you know, we want to thank you guys, obviously, for being here. And we're not finished just yet because now uh, we want to leave you with another uh, segment here. Ever wonder what the world looks like from your dog's point of view? Well, our pal Chester shared his unique perspective with our new series. It's called Chester Walks. And this week, you want to watch this, Chester was especially well-behaved. So we took him to the poshest spot in Central Park, the Conservatory Gardens. Let's watch. And Chester, very well behaved indeed. Well, thank you to everyone. We'll be back next week with tips on how to keep your canine cool this summer. And until then, you can find more Good Dog TV at AKC TV. Thanks for watching.